so the title of the presentation is a bit of a lie, it's a bit misleading, because I'm not introducing closure to you. Um, I'm talking about introducing closure to uh, a large development organization. And uh, so it's not another, this is what functional programming is talk. Uh, I think we've had several of those already. So um, what I'm going to talk about is uh, a project that ThoughtWorks is uh, working on. Uh, ThoughtWorks is uh, a large consulting company and we work with uh, various organizations and, and uh, projects to uh, do software development and uh, try to uh, help other companies build software better. So I'm going to talk to you about a project that we're doing with the Student Loans Company in the United Kingdom. Uh, the Student Loans Company is uh, the uh, government organization that handles all the student loans money in the United Kingdom. So they process billions of pounds a year uh, in loans uh, to people uh, to help them get an education. Uh, the project is uh, a set of services and applications that support the loans process. Uh, so our project is to um, transform sort of their development organization, which is a, a massive uh, number of Java developers uh, working on uh, mixed platforms from Oracle databases to um, banking systems and all manner of things. And uh, we're slowly moving towards uh, sort of a microservices style architecture. And uh, early on in the process, uh, we, we said, you know, like, why not branch out? Why, why are we sticking with Java, which has traditionally been uh, well at home in uh, many large organizations? Um, so we looked at uh, Clojure. Uh, not necessarily in opposition to Scala. We, it's just that we had a lot of expertise in Clojure. And sometimes you, you don't pick a technology based on necessarily what the best one is for the job. You pick it for what's best for the people who are working with it. Um, and it just so happened that we had a lot of uh, Clojure expertise. So what we hoped for was to try and build projects that had less boilerplate than Java, which you, you certainly can get with other languages too. Uh, it was important to have uh, JVM support because we had a lot of uh, legacy Java code to work with. It, um, we were hoping to have something that was interesting and fun, and we thought it would be a better fit for the domain. Uh, one of the interesting things about finance and the student loan system in general is that there's a phenomenal amount of rules that dictate how much money a student gets, uh, when they receive it, how they receive it, and so on. So, uh, you know, building a rules type system in a procedural language like Java can be quite daunting. So it's, it's a, a fun exercise to do in a, a more functional uh, paradigm. So things went okay. Um, things have gone okay. It's a year and a half long project, two years now almost. And uh, we had some good stuff, but we also had some bad stuff. Um, many of the team members were quite new to closure and functional programming. And there were some interesting uh, assertions made earlier uh, in the day and yesterday about um, how exciting and, and easy it is to look at functional code and understand it. But if you're coming from a legacy of 10, 15 years of Java development, it's actually quite difficult to shift your thinking. And uh, so we've, we did run into a little bit of a long learning curve. Um, there, we discovered that we actually didn't have a very good body of knowledge around what it means to write testable, uh, good closure. So we, you know, there was a talk earlier about solid design principles and the functional paradigm. And uh, solid design principles are an interesting way to guide your code uh, towards building something that's testable in OO. It's kind of the best you can do in that model. Um, there's no need for solid and functional, but we weren't dealing with a room full of computer scientists who know how to deal with monads or who could explain a monad. Um, so it is quite difficult in a practical situation to apply all of the functional principles to get to where you need to go. Um, we don't necessarily have an idea of what good code is, but I can tell you now that we really know what bad code is. Um, it's just things that are you know, not extensible, things that are rigid, things that are difficult to manipulate. And so we've ended up with some things like um, treating namespaces almost like classes. We fall back on bad Java design patterns. 
Um, so we end up with a proliferation of small namespaces that uh, end up not being fun to work with. And you know you can deal with bad code in, in some other languages through automated refactorings, but uh, there's, a, there's a great book called Refactoring uh, by Martin Fowler. And uh, there is no good refactoring book for functional programs uh, at the moment. And there are no automated tools for refactoring closure uh, at the moment. Although IntelliJ's um, uh, cursive is coming along really well in that domain. Uh, so these are some of the tricky things that we've run into that have sort of slowed our velocity. But there are certainly some positives. So these are um, some quotes from the designers and architects at Student Loans. Uh, developers are really excited about working with it. It's, it's really put a lot of energy into the teams and into the organization. It's, they found that it's very good marketing for developers. Um, they're getting really good interest from the community uh, to hire new Java developers. And even if they're not hiring a specific Clojure developer, the fact that they're doing Clojure uh, provides an excellent marketing tool and definitely has a future. Uh, and even within the teams, just to sort of talk about the buzz that's been built up, we actually, uh, student loans company developers uh, and an experienced designer have collaborated to bring Closure Hack Nights into student loans. Uh, so that's quite interesting for a large government organization to actually have people coming in after hours and eating pizza and starting with, um, you know, Clojure Cohen's and then working up to Overtone, which is a really cool music generation library. And now they're building a web application completely unrelated to student loans work, but working on uh, a mobile app for uh, people who travel around and work alone to check in with their employers to make sure that they're safe and so on. Uh, and even business analysts and project managers have sat down and started writing code, which is really exciting. Uh, so this kind of goes back to the keynote, which talked about how Scratch makes programming accessible to people who don't program every day, and Clojure is starting to make it accessible to people who do uh, the same thing in student loans. So this is a quote, again, from uh, one of the lead architects that absolutely there is a future for Clojure at student loans. And it's brought diversity into the organization. So they will continue to do closure projects, but even the ones that uh, they will do Java on, um, they can uh, at least take things that they've learned from one domain and apply them to another. Well, that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a very, very short time for one question. Is there any? No, okay. Well, thank you very much once more. There, was, there were. Just, uh, sorry. Okay. Too uh, narrow. So, how many people at uh, ThoughtWorks uh, currently write closure full time every day? Um, I think. There we are. Um, that's a good question. I, I know on my team in uh, SLC, there are about. 12 of us. Um, I know that we have other closure projects going on uh, in London. Uh, I don't know about other parts of the world. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's something that we're very interested in. Okay, thank you very much. So, um, do we have many Scala developers here? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Do people know what Scala check is or quick check, things like that? Yep. Yeah. Okay, so one of the problem I've had with Scala check in the past is it, it can be quite frustrating when you have to constrain a type to be a particular value. So if I had a um, if I wrote a test that looks something like this, and I I, I know this is gonna is gonna fail. Um, where I expected every every integer I passed into into my sorry I've written that wrong um, every every integer in, into my property um, to be positive, 
I, you know, I, I need to do I need to do something slightly different, um, and then I, I need to constrain this like so. And obviously, this this doesn't make much sense, but you know, we're in a lightning talk, so um, so this this then passes. And then the problem the problem comes um, is is when you end up with, with quite a few of these, um, like so. And then we want to make sure that all of these. Is this, is this is this legible? Is this okay? Um, and uh, like so. Um, and then when when it comes to running this, uh, it should. Oh, I thought I could get away with that. I've completely failed. Um, right, but generally, generally, <laughs> in the past, when I've run this, um, it gets to the point where um, the the criteria is exhausted. Um, so you can see here, like this is what I was trying to write. I'm not quite sure why it hasn't worked there. Operating but your precedence. Pardon? Operating your precedence. Is that what it is? I mean, you have to put parentheses. On oh, is that? So I need them, what, here? Or here? Yep. Yeah, okay. Ah, uh, you're right, of course. No, okay. Believe me, believe me. I, I put no preparation into this. Um, is that th this can exhaust the, um, uh, the checker, which means, you know, your, your tests don't, don't, don't work as, as, as they should. So I, I put a little thing together. Um, to, to, to constrain the type. So rather than saying we've got an integer, is that we want to tag the integer and say it, it's only positive. So, um, so it looks something like this. And then rather than having this constraint afterwards, which effectively happens after the generation, um, we can just say that straight away. I've done it again. And then that, that just works because I've, I've constrained this on the type, but then I've also managed to pass this through as an integer. Um, does that make sense, what, what I've done there? Um, this is something I wrote. I, I don't know if this is of any use or, or people have had any feedback or things like that, but I, I wrote a few of these tags. Um, so um, you can say absolute. So then that's... Um, greater than or equal to zero. So if I said that, then that would, that would then fail because an absolute value has to be greater than or equal to zero. But then I've managed to constrain this on the type rather than having to have a set of constraints after the types are defined. So um, let's probably open that up to any questions or a discussion really. Yeah, hi. Can I see the implementation of absolute positive? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah. Um, uh, so, yeah. Sorry, this is it. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. So, so we we create a, a generator for that type. Um, so for absolute here, we then say just call absolute, and then. You know, with Java, if you if you call absolute on integer dot min, it still stays as integer dot min. So we just recursively call that again until we get a value. And then this is an implicit for a numeric of absolute. And then that's the type that we're passing in. And then I've written a few of these: um, absolute positive ne negative ordered. So we could give a, a tuple, and then what's returned the first value is always less than or equal to the second value. So it might just be useful in some case, or unique, so you have a tuple and whatever's returned, the two values are always different. Yeah? Would this, is this useful to people? Do people have this problem as well as me? Yeah. Hi. I got a question, it's not exactly this, it's um, how, in your own projects, how much of what you're doing is property testing? Um, 
I, I try to do it as much as possible. Um, it's, but with, with personal projects, I'm not always the most efficient tester, but that's just for my personal ones. Um, yeah, but then I, I honestly I've found that when I am doing this, the types I'm usually using are usually rich enough that I'm not dealing with primitives, so that I'd have to create an arbitrary for whatever type I had, and then any constraints would then go in that the implicit, like that the generator there. Um, but sometimes just maybe, you know, when I do want an integer and, you know, I'm going to construct a list of n, I want to make sure that n is always positive and things like that. Um, that's where I'd see these being useful. Okay, do we have any more questions regarding? Okay. Can you then combine a few uh, to these uh, types? Uh, probably, I've not tried it, but I only wrote this a couple of days ago. So, um, yeah, but it'd be nice to say, you know, you have a ordered and always positive. So then you got a tuple, and the first one's less than the second, but they're always both greater than zero and things like that. Yeah, that'd be quite an interesting implementation, but I, I, I've not even tried that here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much. I'm about to give you two tips that I think will help you immensely. And first of all, these ideas are not mine. Uh, Steve Losh, I think, came up with them and posted them under the title A Modern Space Cadet. And basically the first tip is to remap your left shift key on the keyboard to uh, type uh, left parentheses and the right shift key to put right parentheses uh, because as developers we put a lot of brackets right so uh, why do we have to press shift and nine or zero that doesn't make sense uh, it's much better to just press shift left shift or right shift um, and uh, I told that I told that to a lot of people and they uh, usually ask me two questions. The first uh, one is, are you a closure de developer? And uh, no, not really. But, and the second, question, uh, the second question is, but how am I going to type uppercase character, uppercase characters? And um, it's, it still works. Like uh, you put the parent if you press the shift key alone. If you press the shift key in combination with uh, a character, then you will get uppercase character. Yes? On the InterJD, a double shift uh, is very uh, heavy sharpened. Okay. And Maybe. Yeah, but I use uh, Ben. Uh, <laughs> but if your editor already does that or something similar, yeah. Um, and the second uh, tip is to map your uh, caps lock key, unless you are some angry person. Uh, <laughs> because the caps lock key is pretty uh, useless. Uh, so we can map caps lock to either, I don't know, control key or uh, meta key or escape. So depending on which editor you use, and I, I think it's much better than have that one useless key on the keyboard. Yeah, so that's all, thank you. I, I, I am going to post the link on Twitter uh, Twitter, so you can just find that post easily. Uh, do you use a uh, tab key on the keyboard? Um, yes, yeah, sometimes. Yeah. yeah, will it take some time to introduce the enhancements to the Logitech keyboards? So that this way, it might be really useful. Any comments on this? Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks so much. <laughs> Okay, hello. Uh, I'm Joost Heikop. Uh, I'm from the Netherlands and uh, I work for a company called Sibia. Uh, we're a consultancy in the Netherlands and uh, we build cool stuff, right? And I'm also an organizer of the Amsterdam Scala user group where we organize a lot of meetups. So you're always welcome to come and speak and... Uh, ah, right. There are two of them. Come and speak or just attend. 
Uh, I wanted to do a quick introduction to Scala for anyone who has no real experience with Scala. I know who of you has no experience with Scala syntax? Who of you have some experience? <laughs> Most of you. Ah, cool. Uh, so, yeah, uh, what I want to do is uh, set up a quick project using SBT and do Hello World and uh, take it from there and see well, well, what fits in the center. Five minutes left. Um, <coughs> so to, ma to make a project, what you normally do is uh, just make a folder for the project. So you say, hey, I have a project, go into my project. Uh, to make this an SBT project, all you need to do is uh, make uh, a project folder. So uh, it's kind of double, so I don't bother. And now if I do SBT, it will just start the project. It will now compile anything in here. Um, what we now can do is uh, start a console. Is this uh, big enough for you to read? Uh, I have a console. Uh, you already saw this from Noel. He, he showed you. And I can do, this is standard, standard REPL where I can do interactive evaluation. Um, if I would have imports in my project, uh, these are all available in this console too. So you can just work from where you are, uh, uh, try things out with the libraries you're using. Uh, if you get stuck somewhere and you want to do some quick checking. Uh, in the console you can do uh, stuff like create a list. Yeah. And then the REPL will return to you what the type is. It actually infers the types. Uh, so for the first thing you said, uh, you can see that it says rest zero. It was the, uh, the result of one plus one, which is an integer. Uh, so this is very handy, but I rather use an, uh, an ID. So if we just say, uh, we want to do a hello world. All we need to do is create a object which extends an app and then we can do Hello world. And if I now, okay, yeah, if I now run this, it says hello world. It's wonderful, right? So what I want to do is uh, show you some constructs through doing creating a linked list. So if I would make a linked list, I would make a uh, what is it a trade linked list and then make a uh, case class node which takes a, a value uh, string and a child of the type linked list. How much time do I have left? Four minutes? Cool. And a case object, uh, what shall we call it? Uh, nil something, only like nil, probably it's reserved, which extends linked list. So I created these things. Now I can make a new linked list by saying I have a node which takes hello which takes notes for the, this child, which says world. And because I don't have a child for the last, I'm going to use a default parameter here, which is the, my nil. And if I now uh, execute this code, it uh, compiles, but we see nothing, of course, because we need to do printing. And go towards the end. You now see I have a linked list of nodes, like a cons list, if anyone knows how these things are. So the things you've seen here is a trait, which is in Scala, it's, it's sort of like an interface and an abstract class. Um, uh, yeah, it's a very useful thing where you can have fat interfaces, you can add uh, uh, semantics to an interface uh, or you might know it as giving it the default implementation. Um, 
here we see a case class, which is a special form of class. So this is a very easy way to make sort of records or data wrappers. Uh, and uh, I think you call them type classes or something, I don't know, uh, what's it called? Uh, well, it, so it's, it's a very light way to, uh, to uh, put in data uh, in, in a class. Okay, if you have a database record, you, you can just use a tuple. But you could also give it a name so it's more recognizable. And uh, the things a case class gives you is that if I now would make uh, a new uh, a node, like I did below, I now have the value available here as a uh, member. And this is all immutable. So you can only get things out, but you can't put things in. Um, and what you do see is I do not need to use something like new. Uh, because um, the case classes in, in uh, Scala have a special sugar which generates a lot of stuff you, 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 you need for this. For, so for this you use the factory method which is a, a standard method which is uh, created on the companion object of this class. Are you guys following? Yeah. Uh, which the sugars to apply and uh, which if you would see the, the actual implementation would look like uh, so I I'm now sort of making my companion object myself and it would have a function which was apply which would take a st string where are you going come on it's not handy to do this standing up. Sorry. So this was the value. And the child, which was a linked list, is my. Uh, what did we call it? My nil. <laughs> is and here you would do something like new nodes and then fill in the value so uh, i think you get the drift what happens here so this is a, a factory method uh, which is generated for you and uh, a lot of other things are generated too in uh, in the case classes that are uh, the equals functions, to compare them to hash functions, etc. So that you can easily compare them. So if I now make two case classes like node, I think my syntax completion went haywire. Uh, I'm line six, you have case CG class. Uh, it's not a class, you have glass. Ah, right, thank you. Yeah, I'm going in fast mode, so I don't have a lot of attention span for <laughs> paying attention to things like that. So if I would do this, something like this, it would tell me that this should be equal. Well, if you would do standard object reference comparison, uh, you would say get false because there are different objects in memory with different addresses. Uh, please execute now. What did I do? Oh. Sorry. It's, like, it's true, right? Um, and another nice thing you get in Scala is that I can now uh, say if I have a node with my foo in there, I can match on it. And in case it's a node with a value, uh, this will probably break. So I probably need this. I can now say print line. So the case class also had the thing called the extractors, uh, which is sort of an unapply, uh, as it's called, which allow you to get the members out of them in a matching. So you don't have regular case switching, but you have the special match in Scala, which is just pattern matching. And uh, you can extract uh, data with this. So I can extract the value here, but I could also say, well, I want something that's a node again, so I can go recursive, and I would have a value two, and have something I don't care about. 
Yeah? So, anyone want to see something special before the time is up? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the time is always up. But we would, we would like to see something special, right? Yeah? yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, but uh, does anyone have a hint of what they want to see? <laughs> that was a question, if there are any questions, I think, uh, 10,000 questions per person. When we have a neat list, we want it to be either a note or nil. Is there a way to somehow, uh, like, force that it is impossible to create other uh, classes that extend linked list? Yep. So if I say sealed trade like this, then uh, the only things that can extend to linked list are those that are declared in this file. And so nobody can extend it if you would really want to restrict it. And uh, I think my case class here should actually, uh, if I would say I want a string, I think it should now complain that this would never match, but I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, so it's now, uh, come on, thank you, it now would say this is a fruitless test because the sealed trait only has the, the two members node and my nil and I'm trying to match for a string so this would never happen. So this typing uh, helps you to, uh, to allow your compiler to tell you it, there is no other option. So if you seal it then you can have this certainty. Okay, are there any other short questions? No? Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Please, maybe you can use just this microphone. Okay. Uh, I want to share with you uh, uh, some information about how to use Scala language on Android devices. Uh, uh, only a few minutes, two minutes or three. Because I, um, I, I started uh, developing on Android four years ago, and uh, two years ago, maybe one and a half year ago, I started uh, programming with a Scala on, on it. And uh, when I started, this was horrible. The tool, uh, which you know probably, SPT, uh, is uh, extremely powerful, but it's horrible. Uh, when you don't know what's what's going on when you start, and uh, when I started, uh, the the tool when I, yes uh, one and a half a year ago the tools was uh, not prepared, but now if if someone is uh, interested to, to to develop new application on Android uh, with Scala, now tools uh, and plugins for SPT are uh, very. Uh, Useful and uh, it's uh, mm, just works eh? properly. Uh, but I um, oh, what? Uh, okay. And, uh, when you start on uh, tr trying to to, to uh, developing uh, by Scala Android using Scala Android. You have two problems to solve. One is uh, that the Scala library has a uh, five megabits uh, of uh, th th the Scala library is huge, uh, and you need to uh, uh, deploy this library with your app file because there is no package resolve no uh, another way to 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 to, to do that. And the problem is that uh, uh, the Delvic, this uh, VM, or Android VM, uh, cannot hold more than 65,000 uh, of uh, method reference. Yep. And you need to uh, treasure yeah, uh, your, your application. And configuration of, of that was, was, uh, was tr horrible. And, uh, now it's now it's automate. It's uh, it's done from uh, uh, done by uh, plugin to SPT, and uh, everything is automated. And if anyone would to develop application to Android, I um, will to to, to uh, recommend. 
recommend, yes, that now it's a very simple um, process and is uh, well ma maintained by open source projects, like uh, Android SDK plugin. And this is everything what Right, thank you very much. Um, and I think that this was the last short talk in the last session of this conference. So I would like to thank you all for attending. I hope it was a nice experience for you. I hope it was a fruitful time and uh, you're willing to visit us next year as well. Uh, please, uh, if you have any comments, any ideas, any suggestions, please uh, write us an email or contact us any other way, uh, please let us know what you think, uh, where should we uh, go, which direction, what should we do better, uh, what you liked, what you, well, I hope you liked everything, uh, but uh, if there are any suggestions then uh, we would like to hear them, definitely. And once more, uh, thank you very much for your attention and hopefully see you next year. Thank you very much.